me I can live in luxury Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams This is the story of Ash Dunhouse, the first graduate dormitory at MIT and the second oldest in the United States. On December 1st, 1937, the Institute acquired the entire property of the Riverbank Court Hotel, at one time the only hotel in Cambridge, just across from Massachusetts Avenue and Memorial Drive on the banks of the Charles River. As a result of the Great Depression, the hotel went out of business. MIT set the moving date for September 1938. Coincidentally, they moved in the day of the Great Hurricane. Over the past 68 years, graduate students from all over the world have lived in this house. Many of them have played an important role in shaping the history of the 20th century. I came in 1939. I think it was the place the graduate students lived. And uh, at that time, the house had only been a year or two away from having been a residential hotel. So it was staffed by the orderlies, the uh, black, or I guess what would now be called African American. My career has been <clears throat> one of uh, occasional, a door opens up and I've been willing to walk through it and see what's on the other side. The magnetic memory started at the end of World War II when I thought I might be going off to work in some industrial company or possibly start a company in feedback control systems where I had been engaged in the servo mechanism laboratory with uh, Gordon Brown of electrical engineering. But uh, at about that stage he uh, called me in and said he had this list of possible projects that uh, maybe I would be interested in, and I looked down through it and picked one of them, which uh, turned out to be uh, an effort to build a, an airplane cockpit, a little bit like a pilot training cockpit, except that it was to be not the replica of an existing airplane, uh, but a cockpit of a proposed plane where all of the information about how it was going to behave came from wind tunnel tests of the, aer of the airplane before it had been built. Well, it turned out that then coming out of the servo lab with analog uh, type devices, it was assumed it would be an analog computer. It became fairly clear that an analog computer could not cope with that complexity, that it would be solving its own idiosyncrasies rather than the problem. And uh, that led me into the field of digital computers for that purpose. And then a man named Perry Crawford, who was a graduate a year or two ahead of me, master's uh, uh, graduate here at MIT, then working for the Navy, suggested to me there was such a thing as digital computers. We began to get into it. I gave lectures in the electrical engineering department in those years to try to persuade them that it was possible to compute with binary numbers uh, and uh, that there was such a thing as digital computers. This led to the whirlwind computer which uh, was the first digital computer at MIT which initially had electrostatic storage tube memory those tubes were costing us, we made them, cost us about a thousand dollars to make them, they stored about a thousand digits. They lasted about a month. We were paying one dollar per binary digit per month to maintain storage. Now how about a cheer for the Navy? The Army's great, the Army's tough, but don't you think we've had enough? So how about a cheer? There was the Navy V5 and V12 program and those folks lived in what became the graduate house later. So the graduate house uh, at the beginning of my time at MIT was devoted to not grad so much graduate students as, as military uh, uh, students. The Army's great, the Army's tough, but don't you think we've had enough? So how about a cheer for the Navy? 
moved directly into Ashdown House as a beginning graduate student. So that would have been in September of 1948. It was the occasion of our graduation in 1948 when he came and delivered a, a speech uh, before the MIT student body and faculty. Uh, of course, I'd heard him speak many, many times on the radio and was well acquainted with this tremendous facility that he had with the language and with words. And uh, it, was, it was exciting to see it in person. He, would, he spoke with great authority and great, great eloquence. I, I cannot now reproduce for you what he said, but it was a tremendous experience. Uh, I grew up in the Depression and uh, many of our friends uh, were, in, were having serious economic problems. And we knew, we knew many families where people were out of work. Uh, and the times were just very hard. So young people of my generation did not have very high expectations. I'd gotten some other prizes previously that year. And I, you know, it struck me that maybe this was belated acknowledgement of one of those other prizes. Uh, so we came uh, walking up to this building. And when I arrived on my floor, it was just crowded with students and press. And there was lots of activity. And, and then uh, I found out that uh, the reason for all of this was that it had been announced that I'd won the Nobel Prize. So once I got into my office, there was a message, an urgent message, saying I had a telephone call from Sweden. Hello? Hello, is that Mr. Schweikart? Yes. How is it, Can sir? you hear me this time? I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Is there any problem with you, with the? Can you hear yourself echoing again? Yes, unfortunately. Oh no. It doesn't seem to be quite as disturbing this time, but um, it it does have an echo. But I think we can go ahead. I I, I don't. It, okay. It's not terribly disturbing today. Yeah, let's go ahead. So I have a few questions, if that's all right. Um, you've only got fifteen minutes, so we'll we'll be as quick as we can. Um, can, can you tell us about how your life was as an MIT student? You lived in Burton House. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, I lived in Burton House from, through all my undergraduate years, from 1952 through 56. And um, I guess I started out in Burton House per se, and then two wings of the building were referred to as Connor House. I don't know if that's still the case or not, but I moved into Connor um, after, I guess, my freshman year. The difference being that you had, I think you had to be a, uh, you had to have a job. You had to be a co-op student or something. I can't remember what they called it, but uh, I worked in, um, I worked in a snack bar in Connor and uh, in, in Burton House. And then I also cleaned uh, the Johns on one floor and you know, odd jobs of that kind to help pay uh, my tuition. I lived in, in the graduate house for a few months right, because my wife was pregnant and had gone down to Atlanta to be with her parents for uh, the birth of our identical twins, what turned out to be our identical twins. And while she was down there for several months, I remember that I lived in the graduate house. I came out of MIT in 56 and went into the Air Force. Um, I was in Air Force ROTC. In fact, I think I was either the commandant of cadets in my senior year or the, the assistant or deputy commandant. I can't remember. But in any event, I went into uh, the US Air Force immediately after graduation in 56 and spent four years, uh, became a fighter pilot, and um, flew F-100s over in the Philippine Islands. When I came back to the U.S. in uh, 1960, I applied to MIT for graduate school, and uh, uh, that uh, I was accepted. And then that went from 60 through uh, 62, but 
to, because I was married and we needed the extra money, I also joined the Air National Guard uh, once I left the Air Force, and we flew out of Logan Airport. So in 1962, when Khrushchev put up the Berlin Wall, uh, actually that was 61, uh, excuse me, in 61 he put up the Berlin Wall, and uh, we were activated and went to, flew over to Europe with our uh, F-86Hs and spent a year over there and then came back in 62 and uh, I had my final year of graduate school and at that time NASA was uh, looking for candidates for their third group of astronauts that they selected and um, I and several other people um, from MIT at that time including Buzz Aldrin and uh, Clark Chapman um, all applied for that third group of astronauts. And uh, in uh, April, I think it was, of 69, or rather 63, I got the phone call and said, Did I, was I still interested? And I, of course, said yes. And uh, that ended a bit of a dilemma on whether I should go on for a PhD or not. That, I figured, let's be an astronaut, the heck with a PhD. So, uh, and that began a whole new life. Uh, and I was certainly accustomed to flying high-performance airplanes and things of that kind, but uh, uh, getting into the space program at that early stage was a very exciting thing. So the family, uh, I and the family moved down to uh, Houston, Texas in uh, late 1963. In fact, exactly at the same time that uh, JFK was assassinated. In fact, he was assassinated as the moving van was pulling away from our house in Lexington. But in any event, um, uh, that began a period of uh, over 10 years of uh, working in the space program and, of course, had the good fortune of flying Apollo 9 in 1969. <laughs>